Okay, yeah. So welcome to grammar class. Uh, the first week will be a basic introduction, and I should also let you sign in. Okay, so you made it to college, and here you are sitting in a grammar class. Some of you might be thinking, didn't we already study grammar for like six to nine years? What are we doing here? And yes, you have. The difference is that in high school and junior high English, your grammar was divided into different units. You, uh, one week you were reading about like smartphones and you did one kind of grammar. And the next week you were reading about like sports and you were doing another kind of grammar. Things can get lost in the middle. So here at uh, MCU DAE, we have decided to give you a comprehensive grammar course divided into two semesters. The first semester, we're going to be talking about parts of speech, things that are below the sentence level. I'll show you the um, syllabus here. So this is our schedule. First week, introduction and basic concepts. And then we're going to move through verbs, lots of verbs, uh, and then the midterm exam, uh, and then nouns and then adjectives, numbers, adverbs, prepositions, punctuation, and typing. So parts of speech, things below the sentence level. Next semester is called sentence structure of English. So we will be focusing on things above the sentence level. How do you combine sentences? How do you create complex sentences, longer sentences? Um, so each week, as you just saw, we will be focusing on a certain number of grammar concepts. This class is a practice-based grammar class. Um, next week, you will receive a handout. The file is already on Moodle here if you want the PDF, but I will give you a paper copy next week. And the handout is 100% practice questions with no answers. So every week, starting next week, I'll come in and I will introduce a new concept or some basic ideas related to that week's unit. And then we're going to do practice questions together. And any questions that we don't finish in class will be homework. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, you're saying that this class will just be doing questions? Why don't we just do the questions at home? Why are we wasting class time doing questions? And my response is, you're right. You could do those questions at home. The question is, will you? I think probably not. So we're going to spend time in class practicing uh, and when we compare answers after each set of questions, you can immediately find out uh, which concepts you're not yet sure of, where you need to focus on in your studies. Now, uh, I like to teach to the test. If it's, I will only teach something if it is on the test. The good news is that I write the test. So I know what's on the test. This is what your test will look like. Uh, here is an example. In the paragraph below, each line has one grammatical error. Circle each error for two points each and correct it in the answer space below, another two points, no partial credit. The maximum score is 40 points. You can ask the instructor about vocabulary. I suggest you use 
pencil. And then I give you a paragraph with 10 lines. Each line has one mistake. And uh, below, uh, for each line, give me the correct version of that mistake. So that's the exam. Um, this semester, it's not 40 points. It, it, it will be 30 points. The circle will be two points, and then the correction will be one point. So if you want to quickly check your grammar knowledge, uh, see if you can find some of the mistakes in this example. It's not easy, right? It all kind of looks like it makes sense. This is because grammar is not about what it says. It is about how it says. The paragraph, the meaning of the paragraph is basically correct, but uh, the way that the language is used has some problems, and that is what we are going to focus on in this class. So almost all of the practice questions in the handout will be like this. Error correction. Find the mistake and correct it. Um, the exam is harder, right? Because each week you know what the concept is about. But for the exam, it will cover all of the concepts that we have discussed before the exam. Uh, so if you're curious, very quickly, this should be appeared, past tense. This should be formerly, which means in the past. Uh, this should be her. Taylor Swift is a woman. This should be linked. Uh, it's passive voice, Beidou. This comma should come before the space. This S should be a capital S. It's a name. This should be one relationship, no S. This should be when, because it actually happened. This should be for, which means regarding or related to. And this should be have. Uh, if a verb comes after to, it's probably in its original form. So these are concepts that we will cover in this semester. Uh, OK, now. We do have a textbook, but you don't have to buy it because I just posted the whole thing here. It's uh, New English Grammar by Andrew Rossiter. Now, the thing about this textbook is that it does not have practice questions. So the concepts will be taken from this book, and then the practice questions will be from the handout. Another thing about this textbook is that for some reason, there are a few very stupid mistakes, uh, which is kind of dangerous because it's a grammar textbook, right? You're supposed to trust uh, the textbook when it tells you about grammar, but there are a few simple mistakes. Uh, if we come across them, I will point them out to you. Um, so as you can see, the textbook is here. The handouts are here. This is for the midterm exam. This is for the final exam. Everything is on Moodle. So if you miss a class or if you think we're going too slow, uh, you can study on your own as well. The only thing you don't have are the answers to the handout questions. Um, OK, I have hidden this from you. You can't see this. This is week eight. So like each week, uh, as I said, we will do practice questions and then you will finish the rest at home as homework. So the next week 
when we come, we will compare answers for the homework. That is a small problem for the midterm exam, right? Because week eight, same thing. Practice questions, homework, but week nine is an exam. We will not have time to compare answers. So I have actually prepared the answers for week eight homework and I have posted them to Moodle and I will show you these answers or I will sh let you see this file after class on week eight. So you can compare answers yourself at home. Uh, OK, next we should talk about grades. 30% um, midterm, 30% final exam, 40% attendance. Uh, the attendance is I passed out the uh, the sign in sheet, right? So if you sign in, you're here. Um, how do I count attendance? If you are absent without leave and you and it's not a monthly leave, I will take away. What was it? Six out of 40 points, 15%. 如果你没有来，然后没有请假，我就会扣总成绩六分，等于平时成绩百分之十五。That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. So if you can't make it, please make sure to take leave. 没办法来，记得要请假。Um, our school also has a monthly leave, right? 例假。Um, that's actually supposed to be open for men and women. So even if you're a guy, if you can't make it and you don't really have a good reason, you can take monthly leave. Uh, and uh, I will not take away from your attendance grade. On the other hand, the school does require you to not miss more than six weeks, right? That's a different thing. Uh, so even if every time you're not here, you do take leave, the school system, I have no control over. So you still should come to class. Uh, just a reminder, the school uh, says you cannot miss more than six weeks. That includes sick leave, personal leave, uh, and monthly leave. Uh, and of course, uh, truancy. Quang Ke Dang is running true. Okay, and then um, here are three resources that I will not talk about in class. Oh, I guess I will talk about the first one, but the second one and the third one I'm not going to talk about in class. Um, but maybe they could be helpful for you. So the second one, the uh, PDF file called English Shui Jijing is a collection of some tips about learning English in Chinese. Uh, and then the third one is a book. Uh, the author is explaining how having good grammar can help your life. Uh, it's an EPUB file, as a Dianzi Shu Dangan. So you will need an e reader app to open this file. Okay, and then one last thing about the course design, the extra credit. So this class I know is not an easy class. Uh, around half of you are back for a second time or a third time, so you know this. So if you have tried your best, but you still don't think you're going to pass, you can do the last chance quiz. Uh, this one. Uh, and to make sure that you do try your best, I will not let you take the quiz until after the final exam. What is this quiz? Well, if you have to take it, you will find out. Now, if you think you will pass, but you don't think your score is high enough, I have an extra credit assignment that you can do for more points. It's not easy. You don't get points from me that easily. 
but if you want to try, uh, you can read this on Moodle. And you can start doing this whenever you want. There's no start date. If you do the extra credit, it will ask you to submit a word file, docx or doc. So uh, I should remind you of the Google Docs error. If you write it in Google Docs and then save it as a word file, this might happen. What's wrong with this picture? There are two things wrong with this picture. Can you see? The first thing, how many words are highlighted? Two words, but the computer says five words. Because the computer is counting letters, not words. The extra credit assignment says at least 2,000 words in English. So if you run into this problem, your word count will be too low. The second thing that's wrong with this picture is that the computer has cut words in half. Right? The second line, S, what is S? The third line, it's probably the second half of the word expectations, but it's been cut in half. Uh, this is for the same reason as the first problem, which is the computer is counting each letter as a word. So it doesn't care if the word is complete or not. And this is a hint. If you see that your words are being cut in half for no reason, you have probably run into the Google Docs error. How do you solve the Google Docs error? You have to open a word processing program that is not by Microsoft. So like Notepad, G Shiban, or uh, go to any website, like a blogging website, copy and paste, and then open a new Microsoft Word file, not Google Docs, Microsoft Word, and then copy and paste back into the new file. Um, yeah, so if you encounter this problem, now you know what it is and what to do. And if you forgot, you can rewatch the video that I'm recording right now, uh, or you can come and ask me. Okay, that is the course design. And if you need to contact me, this is my email. Questions so far? Okay. Um, so let's talk about this PowerPoint, things to keep in mind in an English department. About half of you are freshmen. So if you're not a freshman, uh, some of these will uh, probably, you will probably already know, but some of these things you may not know yet. So the thing about learning English is that English is a living language. How do dictionaries get written? Do you know? Do they find some really smart person who knows every word in English and just interview them? No, uh, English dictionaries are not written by experts. English dictionaries are written by ordinary people who submit evidence. They see a word in the wild, and they realize that this word is being used in a way that the dictionary does not say. And so they record this evidence and they send it to the dictionary publishers. And the dictionary editors are constantly working through the alphabet from A to B to C, looking at all of the evidence that has been sent in. And from this evidence, they uh, come up with a definition that fits the new evidence and they modify the older edition of the dictionary. 
So the true authority on what is correct English is not a dictionary. It is not an expert. It is ordinary speakers of English. The dictionary is always out of date, just a little bit. A little bit. Um, so English is a living language. If you encounter a native speaker of English, more often than not, their use of English is the real authority. So in this class, uh, we talk about basic grammar concepts, but these are just basic concepts. It's like in math class, uh, in elementary school, they didn't tell you about uh, negative numbers, right? They didn't tell you about uh, pi is 1.34. They only gave you complete numbers. And then as you got older, they gave you more and more difficult uh, concepts. Same thing with grammar. In this class, we will cover the basic ideas, uh, but you should know that there is a whole lot more grammar than we will be able to talk about in this class. Um, so some of the actual use cases that you see may not fit what we talk about. So for example, um, I just said that this semester we will talk about parts of speech, nouns, verbs, adjectives. But in fact, the actual definition of a noun, for example, is not, oh, I should say verb. The actual definition of a verb is not an action. A verb is any word that can serve as the main verb in a sentence. So uh, traditionally we say, oh, you can't use that word. You can't put that word there because it's not a verb. But really what's going on is if you put a word in that position, it becomes a verb. In Chinese, we call this zhuanping. But in English, this is the rule. It's not something special. So, for example, if you look at the first sentence, James didn't gift Dylan an invite. You know that gift is a noun and that invite is a verb. So this looks wrong, right? But in fact, if you put the word gift in that position, it becomes a verb, which means to give. And if you put the word invite in that position, it becomes a noun which means invitation, and it's pronounced differently also. As a verb, we put the stress on the second syllable, invite. But as a noun, we put the stress on the first syllable, invite. So the parts of speech don't determine meaning. It is the sentence structure and meaning that determine the parts of speech. Uh, this first sentence also has two other very strange examples of grammar. Let's look at the whole thing. James didn't gift Dylan an invite because she wanted them to come. She was simply being polite. So first of all, who is she? James looks like a, a man, right? Dylan also looks like a man. But in fact, names don't necessarily have a gender. Uh, or you can also say that the gender of names change over time. Uh, for example, Alex used to be a, a, a strictly male name, but over time now more and more women are being are using the name Alex as well. Same for names like Sam. Sam used to be a man's name. Uh, now more and more women are using the name Sam. So in this example, James is a woman. You shouldn't assume gender just from a name. If there are other clues, uh, the other clues are more important. Uh, and then the third point is, James didn't gift Dylan an invite because she wanted them to come. Okay, so who, oh, sorry, so there are four points. The third point, who is them? It's two people, right? So them should be more than one person. So who are we talking about? In this example, them is one person. 
Dylan. Uh, this is also a question of gender. Some people do not feel comfortable you, uh, being referred to as a man or a woman. Some people are so-called non-binary people, uh, which means that they don't fit into the binary erren of man or woman. Uh, so many of these people like to use the pronoun them to refer to themselves, one person. Uh, and this is not wrong. The word them has been used for singular people all the way since Shakespeare. Uh, there's evidence for this. So it's not common, but it's not wrong. In fact, uh, today, if you don't know someone's gender, it is polite to use the word them before you know. So like if you're talking to your friend about somebody that you've heard of or uh, and you don't know their gender, it's always polite to use the word them until you find out whether they're a man or woman or something else. And then the fourth point from this sentence, James didn't give Dylan an invite because she wanted them to come. If we stop here, this sentence may not make sense. She wanted, okay, James wanted Dylan to come, so she did not give them an invitation. That seems strange. But in fact, uh, it, the second half of the sentence is the real reason. James only gave Dylan an invitation because James was being polite. Uh, the, the idea here is if your sentence has a reason and it has a negation, then in English, you are negating the reason. So, uh, you're not OK, so like if you look at this using our usual logic, it means the reason she didn't give Dylan an invitation is because she wanted them to come. But that's not what the sentence is saying. The sentence is saying she gave Dylan an invitation not because she wanted them to come, but because she was simply being polite. In Chinese, uh, 一般的解释是他给人家邀请函, uh, 他没有给人家邀请函是因为他想要人家来, doesn't make sense. What it's really saying is, 他给人家邀请函不是因为他想要人家来, 而是因为什么什么. The position of the no in English does not make a big difference. If there is a reason in your sentence and there is a negation, the negation is always negating the reason. Does that make sense? Don't worry, we'll talk about this um, next semester. Uh, but this tells you that the, the best way to learn English isn't by memorizing rules, it is by observing how people use the language. How much grammar do you have to read before you come across that rule I was just talking about? But if you keep seeing this kind of sentence, then over time, you should be able to pick up this idea, even if nobody told you the rule. Same thing for vocabulary. Even if you don't know what the word means, the best way to learn a word is to use context and try to guess the meaning. Right? What's going on in the sentence? What's going on in the situation? Therefore, what does this word mean? So, for example, uh, this is a line from the poem Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. It says, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tolgy wood and burbled as it came. So, what could a jabberwock be? What kind of thing is it? 
is it okay so let's start from the beginning is it alive it has eyes right with eyes of flame it's moving it's probably alive right is it a human probably not i don't know do you guys have eyes of flame no okay so it's probably not human uh and you know it talks about fire it talks about like wood right wood here means forest so maybe it's like a, a monster that lives in the forest or something sound pretty correct to you maybe uh next came whiffling through the togi wood so wood means forest so what kind of forest right togi does that sound like a, like what kind of forest does that sound like? Does it sound like a happy and welcoming forest? No, right? It kind of sounds like dark and scary, right? Yeah. Uh, and then whiffling. So now we have a situation. We have a monster, eyes of flame. We have a dark and scary forest. So when the monster is coming through the forest and it says whiffling, what kind of information could this be? It's describing how it moves, right? So do you think it's a kind of sound, maybe? Like when it's moving through the forest, that like you can kind of hear it. Like it sounds kind of like it's it's brushing against leaves and plants, right? And then the last line, and burbled as it came. This kind of sounds like something that it itself is doing. Like it's making this kind of sound, right? Burble. So what does this sentence really mean? The answer is it doesn't mean anything. It's nonsense. Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland. It's a nonsense poem. But even though these words don't mean anything, we still get a kind of meaning from them. We still can see a kind of picture. We still can follow a kind of story. Uh, so even if you don't know the exact meaning of a word, uh, you can still use context and guessing to pick up on what's going on. And over time, you will learn some of these new words if you keep seeing them again and again. The third one, dialect. So especially when a book is talking about what somebody says, sometimes the way that it's written will be, uh, it will not look correct, but it's because it's trying to give you the actual sound of what the person is saying. So can you tell what this sentence is saying in, Regular English? Okay, what if I read it to you? Lord of mercy, honey, I sure is glad to see my child. Does that make more sense to you? In regular English, Lord of mercy, honey, I sure am glad to see my child. Uh, so it's the first half is saying like, thank God. Um, so when you're reading and if you like see somebody talking in a strange way, one way to figure it out is to read it out loud, hear what you're saying. Maybe that would help. So these are three examples of how observation, guan cha li, is the key to learning English in grammar, vocabulary, and in spelling as well. Right, okay, and then we're getting into this stuff for freshmen. So uh, in college, each course is taught by a different teacher. Each teacher has their own rules. So uh, sometimes the rules can be different. I told you the rules about uh, taking a leave of absence in this class. If you can't make it, what you should do. Other teachers will have different rules. In fact, uh, when you take different courses, sometimes, uh, different courses will talk about the same ideas and they will talk about the same ideas in different ways. In that case, 
uh, you don't have to try to put them together. Just follow whatever your current teacher says. A good example is you have to take writing in freshman and you have to take writing in sophomore. Your two writing instructors may not tell you the same things about writing. But that's OK. Just do whatever your current teacher asks you to do. And uh, as for which one is better, you can make your own decisions. So uh, you are responsible for what you learn in each course. I am responsible for giving you the information, but you are responsible for learning it. So you can make some choices. Trying, you can try to find out what is the course trying to teach you. Uh, where can you find the course information? And if you think your teacher sucks, how can I learn this by myself? You guys are all pretty busy or you will be very busy soon, so time management will be very important. Some courses, to be honest, you don't have to spend that much time on. So if you decide that a certain course is not worth spending too much time, figure out the bare minimum. What do you have to do to pass? And uh, if the teacher gives you instructions, make sure to follow those instructions very carefully. You might think that's simple, right? Oh, like do what the teacher says. But sometimes instructions can be very detailed, so make sure to pay attention. And then you are responsible for your own learning. So you should be able to know how well you have done before you see your final score. Uh, I encourage you, if you can, try to guess your final score so you can plan how much more work you should do before the final exam or whether you need to go and beg your teacher for mercy or something. Right? You are responsible for your own learning. Now, uh, college is kind of like in between school and work. In high school, you were all treated as children, basically. And once you leave college, uh, after your first maybe six months to a year, your boss will also not treat you differently uh, than any of your coworkers because you will be a full adult. But college is in the middle. So you should try to take responsibility for your learning and for your life. If you do fuck up, though, we will not be too mad at you. But try not to. Try to uh, be a responsible adult. So for example, if you can't make it to class, uh, you should tell your teacher and you should tell your teacher politely, right? Don't say, teacher, I cannot come to class today. Sorry, bye. Right? Try to be more polite than that. Uh, when you contact your teacher, um, try to remember that we teachers are also quite busy. We maybe uh, might not get your message. For example, if you need to contact me uh, and I don't reply within a day, that means I missed your message. You should try contacting me a different way. Uh, and then finally, the third one. This is very important. When you graduate and you get a job, you can't, well, I guess you can never steal money, right? That's never okay. In college, uh, when you learn, we or I don't give you money, I give you points. When you have enough points, you have enough credits, you get a piece of paper that says uh, you have majored in this thing. And your future boss will use that piece of paper to decide whether to give you a job. So, in fact, stealing ideas, stealing points is the same thing as stealing money. If you steal somebody else's answers or ideas and you get a high score in a class and you get those credits and therefore you get that piece of paper and you get a job, that means that you have gotten that job 
in part by stealing. So uh, I know like in junior high, high school, uh, I guess a lot of you have had the experience of like copying your friends answers or like doing last minute work based on the internet or whatever. Uh, but in truth, what that is doing is you are getting points that you don't deserve. Uh, so in college, we take this very seriously. According to the MCU school rules, if you are caught cheating, you will be expelled. Wei uh, Yi That's if the school finds out. If I catch you cheating, whatever that thing is, you will get a zero. Zero. So it's very serious. Now, as for chat GPT, um, do you guys know how accurate chat GPT is? Is that on Twitter do gama? If you think chat GPT is correct, 95% of the time, raise your hand. 90%. 85%. One person. 80%. Wow, you guys really don't trust it, huh? Yeah, okay. So according to OpenAI's own tests, ChatGPT's average accuracy is below 80%. So which means if you ask it five questions, on average, more than one answer will be wrong. Now, the thing is, you're here to learn what you don't know. So if you ask ChatGPT and it gives you an answer, you don't know if that answer is right or wrong. If you know whether it's right or wrong, why are you asking, right? So like, I'm not going to like uh, confiscate your phones. I'm not going to prevent you from using ChatGPT. But you should know the danger if you do use it, especially for grammar. Um, I'll be honest with you. When I was preparing this class, I also tried to write a few grammar exercise questions using ChatGPT, and it gave me the wrong concepts. So especially for more advanced grammar concepts, you really should not depend only on ChatGPT. If you have questions, you can always use Google or you can ask me. Uh, the Department of Applied English also has a, um, what was it called? English Consulting Room, English program. Um, I don't know if it has been announced yet this semester, but the idea is that we teachers are each responsible for a different subject. So if you go to the department office and you sign up for the consulting room for grammar, you will get the teacher who is responsible for grammar and you can go ask them for help. It's me. I'm the teacher responsible for grammar. <laughs> so you, you might as well just come and ask me directly. Right, so this is the evidence from OpenAI. Um, the green one is GPT-4, the latest version. And you can see that for some areas, like for science, it's a little bit over 80%. But for like uh, writing, it's like 75%. So really not trustworthy. Um, yeah, so like in terms of using ChatGPT, uh, because of this problem, we will always need human experts. Uh, experts can use ChatGPT to help them remember things or to give them new ideas, even uh, getting new ideas by looking at mistakes. Um, but if you're not an expert, it's harder to do this correctly. ChatGPT is good for uh, knowledge and information, but it is not good for things like language comprehension and sensitivity. If you don't understand a sentence and you ask ChatGPT, it will read, it will paraphrase it in a simpler way, but that may not help you understand the original sentence. It gives you the meaning, but it doesn't help you learn the language. 
uh, and also like uh, if you ask it for ideas or opinions, it will often give similar ideas and opinions. So if you want different ideas and opinions, ChatGPT also does not do a good job. Uh, and then here's a, a poem about like a, a student who, I'll read it to you, who used AI to write a paper. Now I let it fall back in the grasses. I hear you. I know this life is hard now. I know your days are precious on this earth. But what are you trying to be free of? The living? The miraculous task of it? Love is for the ones who love the work. If you use AI, yes, you will hand in something that's kind of okay. But what do you really get from it, aside from some points? If you're here for four years, you might as well try to learn something. Okay, do you have questions about this PowerPoint? Okay, so the whole thing is on Moodle if you want to review, or again, you can just rewatch this video. Let's take a short break. When we come back, I will introduce some basic grammar concepts um, to help you this semester.
Okay, I have just asked some of your classmates to pass the handout down to you. Does everyone have a copy? Everyone have a copy of the handout? Okay, this handout is for the midterm exam. I'll give you another handout for the final exam. Uh, and as you see, they are all practice questions, uh, fixing mistakes. So we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, first, I want to give you the fundamental basic concept of English grammar, which is the basic sentence structure. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some version of this before, right? Subject, verb, object. But my version looks a little bit different. Every complete English sentence has a subject. Every complete English sentence has a verb. Most complete English sentences have an object. And then there's everything else. If it's not a subject, verb, or object, it's everything else. So things like place, time, tool, situation, uh, manner, degree, all of those things are everything else. In terms of the basic sentence structure, those things don't matter very much. The point is, if a sentence does not have a subject, it's probably wrong. If it does not have a main verb, it is probably wrong. Um, and we will look at more complicated examples this semester, but a subject is not usually just one word. It is often a cluster of words, a subject cluster. Same for the main verb. The main verb is often not just one word. It is a verb cluster. Um, now, this is the basic sentence structure, but many sentences in English move the everything else to the front. When you move things from the basic structure, you must add a comma, 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 you must add a comma to tell the reader that you have moved something, unless you're British. We're learning American English grammar. British people have a very weird and flexible grammar that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, but in terms of American English grammar, this comma tells the reader that you have moved something. For example, the first sentence, he, subject. Uh, let, uh, let me read the full sentence. He bought a book yesterday at the bookstore with his dog. He is the subject. Bought is the verb. Or sorry, I should say the main verb. A book is the object. So it's more than one word, right? It's a cluster. And then everything else is everything else. Yesterday is time. At the bookstore is location with his dog is the companion, like who else is there? The word with sometimes means using this tool, but I'm pretty sure this person did not buy a book by paying the dog, like picking up the dog and using it to pay. Uh, so this is the companion. Um, but this also gives us a very important rule of grammar, which is, uh, it, the grammar does not define the situation. The situation defines the grammar. So as I said, the word with can mean using a tool. 
But the reason we don't use this idea for this sentence is because it doesn't make sense. So it's not because the grammar is wrong. It's because the situation is weird. But sometimes you want the weird situation. If you, for example, if you read a science fiction story where they use dogs as money, then with his dog could mean picking up his dog and paying it to the bookstore. So the grammar doesn't define your situation. The situation defines your grammar. Now we can move some of this other stuff to the front. You don't have to move all of it. So for example, the second sentence, yesterday at the bookstore, comma, and then after this comma begins the main sentence. He bought a book. He is the subject, bought is the main verb, a book is the object. And then you still have extra ideas. So you still have some parts of the everything else that you do not move. So like we have three elements here, right? Time, place, companion. You can move these together separately. It doesn't matter as long as you use commas to tell us that something has been moved. So look at the third sentence. He is the subject, bought is the verb, a book is the object. In this sentence, we have moved some of the everything else to the middle, right? Yesterday with his dog. So to tell the reader that you have moved something here, we separate it from the rest of the sentence with commas. It belongs at the back. If it's not at the back, you need these commas to tell the reader that you have moved it here. If you truly understand this idea, your grammar should immediately improve. When you're reading things in English, using this idea, you should be able to more quickly find the subject, the main verb, and if there is one, the object. And you should be able to see which parts of the sentence are actually not essential. They're only extra information. Questions? OK, so uh, in this class, I usually type the rules and examples, but um, so the typing may take a little longer. I'm sorry to say. Please be patient with me. This comes off in early October, uh, so after that, the class will speed up. OK, so those are the basic that that is the basic grammar concept. I hope you can take with you from this class for the rest of your life. Uh, if you sleep through the rest of this semester, I hope you at least remember this one thing. Uh, OK, do you have questions about everything that I've been talking about so far? OK, if not. Let's move into verbs. Next week's uh, unit, we're going to begin a little bit early. Now, in English, every verb must have a tense and an aspect. Again, very slow typing. Uh, in Chinese, we call tense shi and aspect tai. Tense is, there are only three options for tense. Past, present, future. Yeah. Now for aspect, there are four options. Simple. Progressive. Perfect and uh, sorry, perfect progressive. I should have put perfect first. These two systems are about completely different things. 
you can combine the, any of the first three with any of the last four, and it will all result in a correct sentence. So what do these refer to? Past, present, or future is talking about the real world time. Usually when you're talking, that is the present. If it happened before this moment, it is the past. If it will happen or you think it will happen in after this moment, it is the future. But if you're not talking, if you're writing or reading, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. When you are writing in English, we like to use the past tense to tell a story. So uh, in when you're telling a story on paper, the moment now is actually the past. Uh, and any time you need to talk about the future, you can't just say will, you have to say, where should I put this? You have to say would. Yeah, it's past plus future. Right, so if you're talking about the future from the past, you will use the word would. So, uh, like a very short story, right? Um, I woke up this morning and thought that I would take the bus to school instead of driving because I hurt my hand. So I woke up, it's in the past. But at that moment, I was thinking about the future. So it's in the past looking to the future. Therefore, I have to use the word would instead of will. You can think of it as adding a layer of the past onto the future or seeing the future through the past. Uh, something like that. Okay. But what if you're talking about the past from the past? So like I woke up this morning and then I want to say that I remember something about last night. Then we have to move to the aspect system, the second one. Um, so simple is just there's no aspect. There's nothing special about this. The aspect system is about the relationship between sentences. So the tense system, past, present, future, is about the time of the speaker or the time of the writer. The aspect system, simple, progressive, perfect, perfect, progressive, is about the relationships between sentences. So for example, if I use progressive, right? I am talking, it's telling you that the, the, the talking is going on in relation to something else. So like, uh, we are in class at 2 p.m. and the teacher is talking. So like, the, it's ongoing in relation to the situation. Or like, um, Uh, the teacher was talking when suddenly there was an earthquake. Like the earthquake suddenly happens and it interrupts the teacher's talking. So you're emphasizing that the teacher's talking is ongoing. It's a relationship between sentences. Um, so progressive emphasizes that something is happening. Perfect emphasizes that something has finished and therefore influences what comes next. The point is not that it's finished. If I just want to say that it's finished, I can use the simple past tense. The point is that the completion influences 
what happens next. For example, I have finished writing my report so I can go to sleep early. You can still just say I finished my report, but if you say I have finished my report, you're emphasizing the fact that finishing the report lets you go to bed early. There's a relationship between these two. Perfect progressive is for when you want to emphasize that you have been doing something for a long time up to this point and that this influences the future. So, for example, I have been talking for two hours, so I am very tired. So it's not just that I have been talking. It's not, it's not just that there has been two hours. I have been continuously talking all the way up to this moment for two hours. Therefore, I am tired. So again, it's a relationship between these two parts of the sentence. Um, we'll talk about the perfect and perfect progressive later. Uh, for now, let's simply focus on the general idea and uh, simple and progressive. So back to the original question. If I'm in the past and I want to talk about something even further in the past, I have to use the perfect. In fact, because I'm in the past, I have to use the past perfect. So, uh, for example, I woke up this morning and remembered that I had drunk, or I had drank three bottles of vodka the previous night. So I'm not saying I drank, I'm saying I had drunk. Because when I'm, uh, I'm telling the story, right? I'm saying, oh, I woke up this morning, but the story is already in the past. So if I want to talk about from that moment in the past, I'm thinking even further in the past, I have to use past perfect. Guo Chu Wan Does that make sense? I feel you're starting to get confused. Um, let's see if I can find a, a different way to explain this. So, the as I said, you can combine the tense system with the aspect system. If you use past progressive, past perfect, or past perfect progressive, all of those sentences happened in the past. If you use future progressive, or a future perfect, or a future perfect progressive, all of those sentences happen in the future. Try to keep the tenses separate. So you don't have to think about questions like, what is the future perfect versus the past progressive? Those kinds of questions don't make sense. Keep the past, present, and future separate and think about the four aspects for each time. You don't have to compare across times. So if you're telling a story entirely in the past, you will only be thinking about past progressive, past perfect, and past perfect progressive. If you're telling a story for some strange reason in the future, you will only be thinking about future progressive, future perfect, etc. Don't cross the streams, right? Don't mix up the times. So that's the basic idea, but there are some exceptions. English is a living language. Dictionary editors don't know what they're doing. There will always be exceptions to every rule. In fact, there are so many exceptions in English that English has a phrase called the exception that proves the rule. 
if the rule doesn't have an exception, it's not a real rule. That's how many exceptions English has. So here's the exception to this rule. If you talk about the present, you cannot use simple present. Here's why. In English grammar, the present is one moment and it's gone. Every moment is a new present. So you, if you talk about the present using simple present, it doesn't make sense. As soon as you finish talking, it has become the past and you have lost the present. So in English, in order to talk about things that are happening now, we have to use present progressive. You don't say I talk, you say I am talking. You don't say I eat, you say I am eating. To tell someone this is happening now. So if we don't use the simple present to talk about the present, what do we use it for? We use the simple present to talk about general truths, things that are just usually true. So if I say I am eating lunch at noon, that means that at noon you can find me and I will be in the middle of eating lunch. But if I say I eat lunch at noon, this means that usually if you look for me every day at noon and you find me, I will be eating lunch, usually. Um, if you say the class is ending, oh, that's not good. If you say the class will end at 340, is that right? 240. If you say the class will end at 240, that means that this class today will end at 240. But if you say the class ends, simple present, at 240, this means that every week, if there are no special situations, this class ends at 240. So a simple present is a general rule that is usually true if there are no special situations. Um, but everything else is more or less what it says uh, on the basic concept. There are, of course, a few more e exceptions. Um, here's another exception. So we were talking about present progressive, right? If you want to talk about now, you have to say, uh, am talking right but sometimes uh, this is going to sound very confusing sometimes the present progressive is talking about the future and the best example is if you say i am going to go home that looks like the present right i am going but in fact you know i'm going to means in the future why why is this so weird it's because the, the logic is you are planning to do something. You are currently now making plans. But these plans are for the future. So when you say you are making a plan, you're actually talking about the future. So uh, I am eating lunch in three hours is about the future, even though it says am eating, present tense. But in fact, you're talking about three hours later. I'm going home tomorrow, right? Uh, again, present tense, but it's still talking about the future. So when you run into a sentence with present tense, present progressive, think a bit. Is it talking about now or is it talking about the future? Depends on the context. Kan Chen Ho Wen. Okay, um, now. Those are the ideas, and here is the formula for how to write each of these aspects.
OK, I'm sure a lot of this looks very familiar, but I want to point out some things maybe you have not noticed before. So for each one, I followed this pattern. Simple, progressive, perfect, and perfect progressive. Simple is just the verb, right? Uh, and uh, when we, when you learn a verb, we always say you should learn the three versions, present, past, and past participle, PP or disantai, depending on how your high school English teacher explained it to you. And you need these three parts, present, so you know what it basically looks like, past, because past looks different and is uh, used very commonly, and then the past participle so that you can write the perfect aspect version of the word. Everything else is should be the same for almost all verbs. I don't want to say all verbs because there are always exceptions, but for almost all verbs, everything else is the same. So. For the past simple, it's the version that you were supposed to remember, wrote. Uh, past progressive, the, this is called the present participle, and we will talk about this later in the semester. Why is it called this? But this is the word you use for progressive aspect. It's always, always the verb plus ing. Uh, so the formula for progressive aspect is a B verb, right? B, am, was, are, right? These kinds of verbs, plus your main verb in ing form. Let me let me write it here. So if you need a progressive um, aspect, it's always the B verb depending on time, past, present, or future, right? Past, B verb, sorry, this one, present, B verb, future. Future is a little different. I'll talk about that later, but it's always a B verb for time, the tense, and then ing for the progressive aspect. And this is why we want to separate tense from aspect. We treat them differently. We use them differently. Um, so if you want a perfect aspect to emphasize that you have finished writing and therefore this fact that you have finished will influence later situations, use the have verb. Past tense is had plus the past participle. For write, the past participle is written. There are uh, two or three common past participles. Sometimes it ends with ed, sometimes it ends with en. Uh, but there are many, many different kinds. So you should check the PP for each verb that you learn. And then for the perfect progressive, it's perfect. This is the perfect formula, right? Have plus, I think I'm, have been, oh yeah, sorry. I knew I forgot something. Have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's PP before ING, sorry about that.
There we go. OK, so for the perfect progressive, it is the perfect formula. Right, have plus PP. And the. Progressive. Formula. B plus ING. That's why we call it a perfect progressive. You're combining these two formulas. Um, and because you need an extra word in there, right? B verb plus main verb ING, but your main verb will be, uh, sorry, have plus uh, main verb in PP, but your main verb will be an ING because you're combining it with the progressive. So you need a new word, and the new word is B. Right? Ha, uh, am writing, sorry, have written plus am writing is have been writing. Right? These two, this word is in PP, and then B plus ING. Right? B verb, B verb, I, uh, ING, ING. You are combining these two formulas. So it's the perfect progressive. Does that make sense? So like this can help you figure out what are you reading or if you need to write these ideas, what are you writing? Now, for the future tense, things get a little weird because English does not actually have a future tense. We add a new word to express the idea of future. So in fact, this is a future aspect. Um, so everything you write will have an extra will in the middle. But other than that, it's the same, right? So a uh, simple future is will plus your basic verb, right? Simple progressive is will be, which is the future of be plus writing. Uh, will have. Wow, that's a lot of typing mistakes. Future perfect is the future of have, which is will have, plus PP. And then future perfect progressive is future perfect plus perfect progressive. Sorry, plus uh, progressive is future perfect progressive. So um, let's think about this. I will have been writing. When would we need to say something like this? It happens in the future, or it may happen in the, we Nobody knows the future, right? It probably will happen in the future. And then perfect progressive is emphasizing that something happens for a, continues to happen for a long time therefore influencing what happens next so we might use this sentence for if we plan to write for a long time in the future and then we have other plans after that but uh, spending so much time writing will influence those plans for example, if a friend invites me to dinner tomorrow, and uh, I might say, oh, I really want to, but by that time at, uh, in the evening, I will have been writing the whole day, and I'll be very tired, so maybe some other time. Because I plan to continuously write for a long time, uh, that will influence whether I go have dinner with my friend or not. And it's all tomorrow, so it's in future tense. Uh, admittedly, we don't see the future perfect progressive very often, but it does have a place within the logical grammatical structure of English. OK, so that's the introduction to English verbs. Questions? 
um, if you find yourself getting confused about like when does this happen or something, I always find it helpful to draw a timeline. Right, a line pointing to the future, and then like draw a vertical line to represent now. If your sentence is a past sentence, it will always begin in the on the left of now. If it's a future sentence, it will always begin on the right of now. And then you can see, is it progressive? If it's a progressive sentence, it will con uh, the event will continue from its starting point. If it is a perfect sentence, then the event stops at your starting point. And if it's a perfect progressive sentence, uh, not only does it stop at your starting point, it continues from, uh, it starts from somewhere in the past and it continues up to your starting point and then it stops. I should actually draw this, right? Does that make more sense? OK, uh, everybody thinks about these ideas in a slightly different way. Um, but that's basically how I think about these ideas. Uh, and these are the past sentences, right? If it's a present sentence, move the X on top of the line. If it's a future sentence, move the X to the right of the line. But the relationships expressed by the aspects should be the same. Okay, I finished introducing the verbs. Let's do some practice questions. Take a look at your handout, page one. Correct the mistakes. Um, I think most of these should not be too hard. So let's do them together. And when I say do them together, I mean I will call your name and you will give an answer. Shizhan. Question two should be. So the correct answer should be uh, I think it should be I am living in this city, right? So, like the mistake is instead of B, we should be using am. I am living, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said number two. Yeah. 
Uh, question number one. Uh, Guo Zexu. Are you here? Yes, question one should be. Yes, I am not living at home right now. It's missing the B verb. I am not. Question three. Um, Sun Weihua. Yes, question three. What should what is the correct version? Number three, please. Aha, it's missing something, right? It's missing a main verb. What's the simplest verb you can think of for us? Good, students study at this school. That makes sense. That's a good sentence. Uh, so uh, student, we'll talk about nouns in the second half of the semester, but this should be plural. Students, and then you add a main verb, for example, study at this school. Good. Number four, Liu Yu Zhe. I am studying English. Good. Number five. Chen Yu Pei. Chen Yu Pei, right? Yes, number five. Good. I do not know or I don't know my teacher's name. Number six. My name is CJ. Uh, Zhang Tongyan. Yeah, so put the name in. Good. CJ teaches our English class. Good. If the subject is a singular subject, um, simple present has to end with S. Number seven. You can use he or she. I don't care. Uh, Jiang Jingying. Are you here? Yes, number seven. Do you see the mistake? Okay, he or she is singular. So expect should be expect. Good. Yes. So uh, she expects us to be in class on time. Again, present tense singular, the verb must end with S. Number eight, Wu Pingrin. Number eight. Do you see the mistake? So it says, we always are coming to class on time. So what the sentence is saying, the, the actual literal meaning of this sentence is, every day we are always on the way to coming to class on time. What the sentence wants to say is that we arrive on time every day. So if it is something that usually happens, that always happens, we use the simple present tense. We always come to class on time. Okay? If it's something that usually happens, you don't have to use the progressive. A simple present is okay. Number nine. Zhong Li Jun. Does Tom go to school? Is one possible answer. 
we can also think of a situation where we have to use the progressive. Is Tom going to school means like I'm Tom's mother and Tom has left home, but I'm not sure where he is. So I'm thinking to myself, is Tom going to school or is he going to an internet cafe? Right, I don't know. Um, so those are two possible answers. Uh, the first one, does Tom go to school? It means, is he a student? Does he usually go to school? And the second one is, at this moment, is Tom on the way to school? Number 10. Wang Yuchen. Tom, no go to school. So there are two possible meanings here, right? Either Tom is not a student, so he usually doesn't go to school. Tom does not go to school. And the other one is Tom is not on the way to going to school right now. So Tom is not going to school. Okay? Good. I'll quickly do the rest. Number 11, my sister, singular, doesn't have a job. Number 12, does Sarah already, we, we have the S already on the word does, so has should be have. We only need to add S to the first verb in the verb cluster. So does Sarah have a job. Number 13, do you have a job? Number 14, is Canada in, sorry, is Canada north of the United States? North is a location, it can follow the be verb. So the original sentence is Canada is north of and so to ask the question, you move the be verb to the front. Is Canada north of? 15. I never go to my office on Saturday. There's no reason to add the first two. Never is simply an adverb. It doesn't change the grammar of the sentence. And number 16. Ahmed, Toshi, G, Ingrid, and Pedro eat lunch together every day. It's more than one person, so this should not end with an S. Okay, homework. Please finish up to page... I don't know. Hang on. I need to check. Okay, so we keep going. Okay, please finish up to page. Um, the top half of page five. Five, the top half of page five. Yes. Yes, that's right. So the, the bottom half of page five will be for next week. We'll, we'll talk about those concepts next week. Okay, see you next week. If you have not yet signed in, please come and sign in.